Join our global community of travel lovers at zerototravel.com. Zero to Travel Audio Adventures presents Trekking Nepal. Episode 7, Clothing. We talk about the permits you need, what clothing is best for trekking, and give our top tips for using a squat toilet. All right, day four right. on the trail. Day four, yes. Yes, all right, let's get the rundown. Okay, so today is going to Dang. Dang. Oh, yes, so this is quite uh, long. Yeah. It's going to take seven hours, Ooh. I think. And I was <laughs> struggling yesterday, so yeah. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Yeah. So it's nice. And we'll have some mountain views and some nice valley. And then in 10 minutes, we will check in our permit. And, and then we'll, and then we'll we cross some bridges. And then it'll be nice village called Saleri. And then hopefully we will have lunch at Film. Film. And uh, then maybe there's some uh, internet access there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I I just heard from here, from the uh, lodge. So, yeah, after that, the trail is flat, nice, some waterfall, beautiful waterfalls. And then um, after lunch, about one hour later, there would uh, there is a two two different trail. One is called Tsum Valley. Oh yeah. And uh, which is very uh, new um, uh, trekking route um, that's open uh, in 2008. Mm. That is uh, we have to have a special permit mm. like Manaslu. Yeah. And then we're not going there, so we. Have you been there? Yeah, I've Isn't been nice? there twice. Yeah. yeah, it's very, very uh, basic, Yeah, nice. And then it's a uh, uh, Buddhist region. Mm. It's covered by Buddhist uh, monk. There's many um, monasteries there. Yeah. We have to sleep in the monastery sometime. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> because interesting. Because no, no mm. lads there. Um, you said that we're going to meet a lot of different kinds of people today. Yeah. So here we met... Lots of people are gurung, and then in until lunch, they are still gurung. Gurung. After that, it will be a different kind of kastakal boti or sherpa. Okay. They which is they are belong to Buddhist religion. And that's the sherpas everybody yeah, is knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then. They're actually they're Sherpa, but uh, they have uh, many different branches in their uh, caste. So they're uh, in this region called Bote. Mm. So it's same same branches of uh, Sherpa. Bote Sherpa. Yeah, Bote yeah. Sherpa. Okay. Will we so, see any monasteries today? Um, not today. No. Uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Mm. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thanks, and we better, I guess, get to walking if we're going to make it all the way to Dang, right? Dang, yes. Thank uh, you so much. Bon, bon, uh, Domneba. Domneba. <laughs> yeah, that's thank, thank you. you. Thank all right. you. There is something called a restricted area permit. Then there are a couple other permits you need, the MCAP and the ACAP, and those are conservation area project permits. And because Manaslu goes through the Annapurna region, I think we needed to get the Annapurna. Yeah, because we were coming on the other side in that area, so we needed it for both sides. The MCAP is the, the Monoslu Conservation Area Project. The ACAP is the Annapurna Conservation Area Project. And because this particular track goes into the Annapurna region, you have to have both those permits as well. And therefore, we needed three different permits for this track. That was arranged by the agency. It's not anything to be intimidated by. It can easily be arranged in town as all of these tracking logistics 
can be arranged very easily in, in town, I mean, in Kathmandu. When but you it's land. important to make sure that you have have them with you um, when you get into that the village where they need to see the permits. Samir dropped them off. The, the checkpoint was in Yagat, and Samir dropped them off because that's his responsibility as a guide because, again, in the Manaslu region, you have to have a guide. Therefore, it's the guide's responsibility to go check in and hand in the permits. Yeah, so if you come there, like we experienced, it was this one guy that had, uh, he was there at the same time, I guess, and he didn't have a guide, and he wouldn't be let further up on the tracking route. Because, oh, that one guy? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, there was somebody that had a guide that wasn't really a guide. He didn't know yeah, what he was yeah, doing. Yeah, that was true. He had a guide, but he didn't have the papers. That German couple. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Um, and the money is reportedly used f- uh, to improve the area. Yeah, to build like uh, suspension bridge bridges and be like have the maintenance, maintain- maintenance of the of the track. The mule trains could bump you off the track Easily. and send you rolling down the cliff. It was important so, to stand on the mountainside and lean in. Don't do not stay stand on the, on the, the cliff side. side. <laughs> the mule trains usually consisted, I would say, of around 15 to 20 mules, maybe yeah. 10 to 20. Yeah, and then some were shorter and some were longer. Some were really big. And they have the bells on, like the the first one are, are wearing this beautiful collared... I don't know how to call it. It was like a not, vibrant uh, yeah, headpiece. Yeah, it was beautiful. And they have all these bells on to kind of like let let people know that they're coming. So that was good. And they are carrying everything, like food, construction items, uh, garbage, like plastic, and luggage, and um, firewood. Usually there was a Nepalese man leading them at the front. And oftentimes a younger boy yeah, yeah. at the back driving yeah. the train. Yeah. To make sure that everyone uh, came came wed. Yeah. Sometimes they would stop and eat and eat up yeah. to... We have one story, on. though, that was like pretty scary. That was... We were walking on the, on the trail and there were a mule laying there dead. And the, and the stomach was like really blown up. So it had been there for some hours, but it was laying in the middle of the uh, of the path. So we had to like go over it, and we didn't know why the the reason why it was dead. So we asked our guide like if he knew like why. And then I think at night when we have come to the tea house, he had talked to somebody, and the reason why it was dead was that a stone from a bow on the trail had like fallen down and hit the mule. So that was, after that, I was looking more up, I guess. That was kind of scary. That could have been a person. It has been a person. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that is scary. This is fourth day walking, a little trail confessional. I better pay attention because I just walked near a very dangerous cliff. Um, (laughs) I feel great. Uh, It's been three days and yesterday was rough, but I know it's early in the day. We haven't climbed many hills today, but I feel like my body is adjusting to life on the trail, which does take time. And... I stretched last night, and that seemed to make a big difference because I'm not as sore today. Definitely something I recommend. One note, we have had a hard time charging things because most of these villages, or all of them we've stayed in, do not have electricity. So I've seen a couple guides, a couple people carrying solar panels on the outside of their backpacks that can be utilized as charging stations. That's something I would recommend, actually. 
now we're getting some views of a very large mountain that's I'm not sure what the name of it is, but there's snow on top, so I think it's over 7,000 meters. Still walking along the river. It's been a beautiful walk. A lot of donkey trains, mule trains today going by, so you have to step aside for them. And as we walk through these villages, we see a lot of scenes from the villages, from people making baskets to brushing their teeth, bathing in the communal water spigot sitting on a rock ledge talking sharing community and it seems the village is very tight very small they come together for many occasions because everything is is open and of course we're here at a time when the weather is good i don't know what it's like during the monsoon season here we're getting fierce rains colder weather these villages are it's really special places and each one has its own sort of unique charm as a porter is approaching. These porters are superhuman. They're carrying, the camping porters are carrying 60 to 80 kilos. Namaste. The guy that just passed must have 80 kilos on his back carrying it with a band over his head. It's just truly unbelievable. It's, they have superhuman strength. Many of the children are asking for balloons or pens or chocolate. And I read about that in the guidebook. And that is a common thing. Many of the children on the Manislu Trail aren't as accustomed to trekkers. So that's actually not the norm. Most of the children are just coming up to say hi. They're curious. And just fun. Just being kids. Last night there was a party in the village. The village came together. They played music. They danced for a few hours. Brought out a big booming speaker. And had a throwdown. It looked like they were having a great time. We're getting into some climbing now. So I'm going to end this little trail confessional. We're still at fairly low altitude, just something like 1,200 meters as we climb closer to Larque Pass, day four of walking here on the trail in the Himalayas. In general, when it comes to hiking and trekking, outdoor sports in these types of environments, cotton is super comfortable. I like to have a cotton, one or two cotton t-shirts with me, but it doesn't wick moisture and it doesn't dry quickly. And when it gets wet, it affects your body temperature and it makes you cold as opposed to outdoor clothing has a certain combination of fabric uh, that's made to wick your moisture away and that's what you get when you get for example you don't want to wear cotton socks you want to wear wool socks or some type of technical socks technical socks that have a, bl- a blend <clears throat> that allows but your cotton feet is cotton gives you blister for example yeah when it gets wet it stays wet and it yeah. won't dry but and the it keeps wool your feet will transport the moist so it will keep you dry even if your socks are wet so wool is the key i think to I, i'm i'm like i'm a wool person all year round i wear wool she socks. comes from a sheep farm right now that's true but like wool is wool is really really the best and of course like technical um well you're not gonna wear wool underwear no, but I mean, like, <laughs> wool socks, I can wear it the whole year round, basically. You have thin, thinner wool socks, thicker wool socks. Um, and you should have w- wool the closest to your body. And then you can, and layers are important that you have, like, uh, different kind of layers, like windproof, waterproof, and that you can easily take off layers. 
that's the key too. Like you can like if you just have like one really warm jacket and that's it, then you will have a problem that in between times when it's like too hot with that but too cold to not have it on, you know? So layers are key. Layers are always key yeah. in, in trekking or hiking, I think. I yeah. agree. It's uh, And make sure you have enough socks, I think. It's yeah. And underwear. Yeah, and all this being said, we were laughing because we have all this technical gear and things that are good for the outdoors. And everywhere you look, all the Nepalese people, they're just wearing cotton shirts and you know sweatpants or jeans or whatever they have and they're surviving out there yeah, in the mountains so but this is um yeah this is the western take i guess but if you want to be prepared in a in a way where you can be comfortable along the way then i think technical gear that is made for the outdoors for hiking and trekking is great for travel in general because if you have those pieces they don't wrinkle as much uh when you sweat you're okay when it gets wet you're okay um they're just very versatile all around for travel all right this is the prayer wheels and dang and when you approach what is the proper thing to do um it's uh it has a uh, lot many meanings yeah so it's especially for good luck for everyone inside the prayer wheeler there is a uh, lots of lots of uh uh, mantras of uh, Buddha. Um, it's called Om Mani Padme Hum, which is the main mantras of Buddha, and then it means to have a good luck for everyone, and then bring peace, happiness. Yeah, it's I, the main. I love that, and yeah. that's the writing on the outside. Yeah, is the outside. Om Mani Padme Hum. Padme Hum. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. and we have to walk a certain way. Is that? Yeah, we have to walk always clockwise. Okay. So it's a uh, left hand. Okay, and uh, we will walk around now and spin them. Yeah. And say, say Om Mani Padme Padi Padme Padme Hum Hum. Yeah. In our heads yes. as we walk around, and yes. as we enter the village. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You spin the prayer wheel clockwise, as the direction in which the mantras are written is that of the movement of the sun across the sky. Prayer wheels are a cylinder shape. They're usually made of metal or wood. And they have carvings in them that are symbols that represent the mantra they use for Buddhism and Hinduism, I believe. It's Om Mani Padmi Hum. Normally they are placed like before you enter the villages. So when you get into a village, it can be smaller or bigger versions of this. Some places it's like uh, it's 75 meters with prayer wheels before you enter, uh, enter a village. And you're always supposed to go on like the... So you have your right hand to spin it. It's because when you enter the village... Enter and leave a village. You do it. You have to go... You can't go around it counterclockwise. You would have to go around it clockwise. In order to do that, the prayer wheels are going to be on your right side. Yeah, all the time. All the time as you're entering. Which... And... Then as you're leaving, the same, you're just walking on the other side of yeah. them. Yeah. They are beautiful and they are very peaceful. Yeah, they are. Because I think they force you to become mindful as you walk into a village. You know, we have a tendency to be thinking about a lot of things a lot and so much is going on in everyday life. And even when you're hiking, your mind can drift and one of the best things about going trekking on a trip like this is just getting back to nature and getting some of that peace of mind. And then as you enter a village, you you see these prayer wheels. You just start, you walk up to them, and as you spin them with your right hand and walk along, 
you can recite this Om Mani Padmi Hum, and you can just focus on that and the sound of it and the spinning of the wheels, and you're just present and you're just there. It's really a beautiful experience. And these prayer wheels have something majestic and calming about them. And it was something we really loved doing. I think we both really enjoyed when we enter a village, going through and spinning the prayer wheels and just being present and making that a ritual, a tradition, and just getting grounded and being there in the moment. It was beautiful. We just got to our room in uh, Dang? Dang. Dang. Yeah, Dang. Dang. And. <laughs> and Dorta doesn't like a few things that are going on right now. That's for sure. I did something very stupid. <laughs> I took my flip flops because I couldn't get my toes like a camel toe and it was hurtful. <laughs> it's a camel toe. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, like with socks and like Havianas. So I had this brilliant idea that I would cut them open <laughs> because then I would get the socks in. Cutting open the um yeah, the, the part like where the, that goes between your toes. Yes, because because the, it's not On your it's not normal Havianas. It's like a little bit more. That that's in my like. It's it's not a. Uh, it's got like it's more not than the original. Two straps. Yeah, it's more yeah. than two straps. So I thought it would be solid enough to to wear it that way <laughs> and it's now my Havianas is totally useless totally useless <laughs> wait that sounds like a direct quote from me when I was telling you not to do it <laughs> no you just admitted that you actually believed in me for well, a few seconds you, I, I said they would be totally useless but then for a second you had me convinced that they wouldn't yeah and I, um, I <laughs> didn't was go the way convinced you wanted. for a long time that it would be cool, but now I have my boots on again. <laughs> After <laughs> nine hours of hiking, I yeah. still have them on. How was your day, honey? It was good. It's been fun. Yeah, I'm a little tired right now. Yeah. Uh, and we should go and get orders and food. Are because... you hangry? No. Do you, that, do you want to explain what that is? <laughs> yeah, it's angry because you're hungry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. He's kind of asleep. Uh, you're not hangry? No, I'm not hangry. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, I forgot my other sock. That was stupid. Sorry. Oh, you only put one sock on. <laughs> you're tired. <laughs> yeah, and we got to this nice place, and, you know, beggars can't be choosers. I mean, we got here last, I guess. We got the last room. But uh, they have these nice upstairs rooms. We can't seem to get the upstairs room, no, can we? You know who I'm hiking with? Slow mo. What do you? Who's slow mo? Jason do you want to explain? Christopher Moore. He's oh. slow mo. So my name is Jason Moore, and some people call me J Mo, but my wife calls me slow mo. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct. Why is that, honey? Because you're so slow. Everything what do you mean by What do you mean by that? You're very slow. In the morning, you're very slow. You slumber till like the unbelievable limits, and then like <laughs> to get ready, you're very slow, and you don't know where any of your stuff are. And you're asking me, and I'm telling you that you're almost four years old and you have to <laughs> take care of yourself soon. Wait a minute. Hold on. And this is too much of a trail confessional. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You've crossed the line, Missy. <laughs> So, uh, I'm, I'm a little brain dead in the morning, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, even uh, our guide used the term slow-mo twice today before you came to breakfast. <laughs> oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, he likes it, huh? Yeah, he likes it. Yeah. You got to pee? <laughs> Kitten squat toilet? Mm, We've got some good squat toilet tips. Maybe Do you have any squat actually, toilet tips for the ladies? Stay with your legs spread as long as most <laughs> you can. Spread them out as much as you can? Yes. And, um... Like, past where you're supposed to put your feet? Because they have, like, the places where you're supposed to put your feet. Do you go wider than that? Yeah, yeah, I go wider than that. Okay. I go outside of the white thing. Or it's not necessarily white either. It's brownish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that's yeah. your number one tip for the ladies? Yeah, for me that's the best at least. And mm. I'll always have paper in your pockets, like fill all your pockets up with paper because you never know when you run out. And have like a small antibac with you too. Antibacterial? Yeah, and yeah, and uh, I would also recommend, of course, the, something strong in front of your nose sometimes. That's a good tip uh, we figured out. What is it taking? What is that stuff? Menthol? Yeah, it's uh, called Valdebeco in Norwegian. Uh, it's like an old... It's uh, Norwegian. Yeah, it's an old kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you but if you, have, if, if you have liquid menthol yeah. or like liquid mint... Some kind of strong oil or something. Something that's okay for your body yeah, yeah. to put on your body. Yeah, yeah. Then what you do is... You put like uh, a little bit on your finger and then you rub it... Um, uh, or you, you take like one drop in both of your nose. In your nostrils. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you put a little like mint in your nose kind yeah. of. And it's refreshing. It cleans yeah. out your breath. And then when you go to the squat toilet, it smells... A little better. Ah, minty fresh. Not minty fresh, but, but... Some of them haven't been bad, but on the trail, they can get pretty nasty. This one's a little bit... It's nasty. And, uh, it's okay, yeah, but it's... The, the last one was really clean. Yeah. And they were keeping it clean. Yeah. This is the day four walking summary of day four. We started in Jagat and we hiked uh, about three hours to fill him and that was a place where they had internet believe it or not so we emailed our parents and ad checked on her status of her medication and all that good stuff we had lunch there that was average right fried noodles with veggies and uh, Dawbot, which is pretty much our standard lunch at this point. Then we hiked onwards, and we decided to push further than we normally would. Where we were going to stop at Piwa, but we ended up going to Deng, uh, which takes about four to five hours. So we hiked about eight or nine hours today. We came into the gate at... Dang, they have a beautiful stone gate, and it has three stone cairns built on top with prayer flags hanging from it, and these gates are really, really nice when you walk into them, and the way the tattered prayer flags are blowing in the wind, and then there was prayer wheels, and that was lovely, and then we got here and had a potatoes and vegetables and doll bot again and i think it's safe to say we're only four days into this trek and we're both pretty sick of doll bot uh, if i get good doll bot i enjoy it but today i had a really bad day and i haven't really felt that it was that great but yeah i enjoy it i like the doll bot I think it's fun with the different kind of styles, different curries, different pickle stuff, like chili stuff and, and the lent soup. Yeah, I like it. I'm a fan. And Dort is digging into the bag right now. Honey, do you have anything else to add about the day? <sighs> the bridges, which I... Oh yeah, the suspension bridges. <laughs> Which you what? Hate. How about the um, one wooden bridge we went over? How did you feel? Uh, I felt like my legs would... <laughs> uh, they were shaky and... I'm sure it looks like I pooped my pants when I walked over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically what it does, I guess, when I'm walking over them. Yeah, it's scary. It's scary. I'm just like, when you have that like bouldering river down like underneath you and that shady bridge and it's so windy like the longest bridge up here 
it was so windy in the middle and, and straight, straight in the middle there was also like a big hole on the bridge that was like I'm so glad I, I was walking there with the guide somewhere or else I would have like freaked out probably <laughs> if I came out there by myself and realized it was like that yeah I'm not a fan of those bridges I like to go uphill that's my favorite uphill no. and flat not across these what you call not they're suspension bridges but you call them suspicious bridges because you don't trust them no no and then that like but they are well built the metal ones especially yeah but, but the, we the also wooden had one some wooden one we yeah. crossed was a little bit very indiana jones got your heart racing and now we're in uh what's the name of this guest house Shangri-La, and Anna Dorta's not in her own Shangri-La. She's not very happy right now. She's making a face as if I just cooked dinner and it didn't turn out so well. No, it's not bad. It's like if you pooped right in front of me. It smells like it's a uh, very intense You smell the toilet? Poop. Oh. We got the last room here, and it's right in, next to the toilet, so... I don't smell it right now, honey. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't have very good nose. You know, you couldn't be like a police dog. I could be a police dog. <laughs> Maybe that's fun. <laughs> I think that's about enough for the night. <laughs> I think it's time for bed. <laughs> when Anna Dorta starts committing to a new career as a police dog. <laughs> yeah, we got the downstairs room. It's a little musty. I don't know if we have a roof, actually. Maybe why that's why this plastic's here. Mm. Anyway, we're off to bed. Put some of that menthol stuff on your nose, yeah. honey. Trekking Nepal, coming up in episode eight. We're going to Namrug, which is... Um, 2,500 okay. meters. We're, we're getting up. Higher, higher up. And yeah. then. We're just passing through a jungle area. What you recommend for people coming, trekking to Nepal, what they eat when they're on the trail. Because of that, tourists get sick. Mm. Beautiful up here. And the higher up we go, the more Tibetan prayer flags you see blowing in the wind, tattered. And with, framed in with the mountains in the background, the Himalayas and the snow-capped peaks. This audio adventure series has been brought to you by ZeroToTravel.com. Ideas and advice to help make any of your travel dreams a reality. Join our global community of travel lovers at ZeroToTravel.com. Hey, it's Jason here. If you are enjoying this series, please stop by zerototravel.com slash trekking to join our global community of hikers and discover the ultimate resource on trekking worldwide. You'll also learn more about our upcoming authentic small group walking adventures. That's zerototravel.com slash trekking. <laughs>